руки Его. Придите, поклонимся. И поклонение это не только когда хор поет. Поклонение это не только тогда, когда мы проповедуем. Или когда мы э, поем, может быть, соло. Поклонение это вся наша жизнь. И я хотел бы, чтобы наше присутствие на этом месте, это не было просто слушание Слова Божьего, созерцание того, что здесь происходит, но чтобы было это место и время активного поклонения живому Богу. То есть, когда проповедуем, будем молиться, когда хор поет, будем молиться, будем в благовении пред лицом Господним. Поклонимся Господу Богу нашему, написано, ибо Он есть Бог наш. Кто из вас сегодня может сказать, что Он есть мой Бог, Он мой Господь, Он мой пастырь? Если Он твой Господь, будем поклоняться Ему, будем славить Его. А сейчас, брать Ваня, послужит словом, пусть Господь благословит. Слава Богу! А перед тем, как я начну проповедь, я просто хотел объяснить, может кто-то слышит песню, не знает, что за слово повторяют постоянно, Иешуа, Иешуа. Это получается по арамейскому языку, это имя Иисуса. Иисус — это греческое имя, это просто перевод. Он сам говорил по-арамейски, скорее всего, и его имя было Иешуа. По-английски это будет в прямом переводе «Джашуа». Просто если кто не знал, то вам такой факт сегодня, чтобы никто не смущался, думал, что это непонятное слово какое-то, это просто имя Иисуса на его родном языке. Мой сегодня будет что-то, что я очень пассионирую, и я думаю, что большинство церквей, которые я посещаю, они немного проблем с этим. And I call it power and direction. Maybe you remember a story in the Bible in John chapter 4 about Jesus talking to a Samaritan woman by a well. And she found out he was a prophet and she asked him, where's the right place to worship? You Jews say that the right place to worship is in Jerusalem. Our people, the Samaritans, say that the right place to worship is on the mountain. And Jesus gave her an answer. He said, the time is coming and the time is here now when the true worshipers of God will worship him in spirit and truth. Those are the kind of worshipers that God wants. So he says in spirit and truth. And in my ministry, that's kind of been kind of a, a theme that's been recurring for the past few years. And I like to kind of take it apart. If we worship in spirit and truth, these are two really important parts. They go together to make any successful ministry, any successful Christian life. And I want to read another verse that kind of talks about that. It's out of the book of Romans, chapter 1, verse 5. The English Standard Version says it this way. It's talking about Jesus. Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all nations. So where I see spirit and truth here is in the words grace and apostleship. It says through Jesus Christ we have received grace and apostleship. For what purpose? For the obedience to the faith among all nations. For his name. So, in the Russian version, it says something like, для покорения веры. It almost has a sound to it like you're going out to war, to bring to obedience all the nations for the sake of Jesus' name using these two, these two weapons, grace and apostleship. Grace is what powers everything we have. All of our healings are by grace. It's the unmerited favor of God, the mercy of God. All the healings we have, salvation, forgiveness, financial blessing, uh, again, physical healing, All of these things are by grace. It's like the driving force, the power that powers all of Christianity. And apostleship kind of consists of a couple of different things. A correct knowledge of the truth, the true doctrine, and a personal sending into, into ministry or into a calling. The word apostle means someone who is sent. And apostleship is a sending of God. First of all, with the correct, uh, with the correct teaching. And second, with a personal call in your life to do something specific for God. So these two things we need, grace and apostleship, spirit and truth, or as I call it, power and direction. And the way I like to illustrate it is the way one of my teachers, Paul Gurgi, illustrated it to me nine years ago or something when I was in our uh, teen Bible school. And he said, if you can imagine a cannon, you guys know what a cannon is? It's this big metal tube with gunpowder. You light a fuse and the gunpowder explodes and a cannonball flies out and does a bunch of damage to things. They used to be used a lot uh, back in the day. So imagine a cannon. There's two kind of important things for a cannon to be effective. It needs to have power, it needs to be able to push the cannonball out, and it needs to have the proper direction, because if you're pointed the cannon the wrong way, it's going to do damage to the wrong things, or it's going to miss completely, and you're going to waste your power, right? So imagine how effective a cannon is 
if it has a lot of power, if it has a lot of gunpowder in there, but you can't get it to point in the right direction. That's not very effective, right? You're going to do a lot of damage to yourself, you're going to do a lot of damage to who knows what, but you're probably not going to hit your target. And the opposite is true. If, let's say, you can get a cannon pointed the perfect way, you can get it pointed exactly at your target, but then you have no gunpowder inside, it has no power. So what's the point? I mean, you have it pointed perfectly, but it's never going to get anywhere. So, unfortunately, a lot of churches, I kind of see that same dilemma. A lot of churches focus only on the power of the Spirit, but not enough on truth, not enough on the correct doctrine and teaching. And what happens in a community or in a Christian life or in a, in a church that does this, they become very powerful. They have a lot of spiritual things going on, maybe even healings, prophecies, speaking in tongues, interpretation of tongues, all the spiritual gifts. Um, people experience healings. The gifts of the Spirit are poured out. But because there's no correct doctrine, there's a big problem. It says for lack of vision, the people perish. And when there's a lack of doctrine, people tend to do a lot of damage. And you, see, you hear stories about people hearing a prophecy and then moving to another state or moving to another country because California is supposed to go underwater or there's supposed to be a giant earthquake or it's supposed to end May 12, 2009, then May 21st, 2011. And all these prophecies, people get misled by them. And even if there's actual power in the church, even if there are legitimate prophecies, they kind of get drowned out by the noise because the church is so focused on power that a lot of the people can't tell the difference between a good prophecy and a bad prophecy. It's just like a cannon that's pointed in every which, way, every which direction it can, but it has a lot of power. It does a lot of damage. And this is what happens in a, in a Christian life or in a community where it's all, all the focus is on power. All the focus is on let's feel the Spirit. Let's get into the presence of God. But there's no focus on teaching, on doctrine. Um, and a lot of times people say we don't even need that. That's for, that's for unspiritual people. We're so spiritual we don't need to know the doctrine or the Bible. And a lot of times you talk to somebody like that and you say, well, like, what does the Bible say about this or this? And they don't know. But they have a lot of experiences. They have a lot of uh, emotional experiences, maybe. And here's the opposite of that, right? The canon that has the perfect direction but no power. I've seen churches like this, too, and I've seen people like this, unfortunately. And this is kind of where I lean on this spectrum. My problem is a lot of times there's people who know the truth. They can tell you the Bible word for word. They can, you know, if you tell them where is, you know, this particular phrase written, they'll give you the the verse, and then they'll quote it in five different translations. But they just have no power in their lives. And a lot of churches are like this. They, they look at the churches who are all about the power, who are all about the gifts of the Spirit, and they say, man, we don't want to be like that. We don't want to be crazy. We don't want to be dangerous. We don't want to do damage to our own people. What we're going to do is we're just going to focus only on truth, and we're going to know the doctrine perfectly. And a lot of these churches, they believe in prophecy. They believe in the gift of tongues. They believe in the interpretation and healing. But when you ask them, does it actually happen? Well, no, it doesn't, it doesn't happen, but we're hoping someday it will. Because we know the truth so well, we know it should happen, but there's just no push. I mean, it's pointed in the right direction, but there's no push. There's no moving force that causes these things to happen. And unfortunately, this is kind of a big problem in a lot of modern churches. I mean, you've probably noticed yourself, uh, there's, a lot of, <laughs> there's a lot of like prayer groups and house groups and maybe even church groups that they're all about praying and praying, but they barely know the Bible, barely ever read it, barely... They think theology is unspiritual. They think that if you go to a Bible college, that's it, game over, you're unspiritual. And there's other kinds of groups. You know, usually they're the more educated kind who think, man, these people are so immature. These people who seek miracles, these people who speak in tongues, they're just, they're not the type of Christians we want to be. We want to be uh, sophisticated. We want to be educated. We're going to focus on doctrine. And usually what happens is you get people who say, well, if that disease is in your life, brother, that means God has a purpose for it. You just need to bear it out. And they don't even pray about healing because they know that there's no power to, uh, to get that disease out through the miraculous healing of God because they think, well, you know, maybe God has a will for this. And it's kind of like an excuse because they don't have power. And I want you to imagine, imagine, you know, in 1500 or something, there's two battleships with a bunch of cannons lined up. And one of them is bragging about, well, our cannons are so powerful. They're amazing. They just do so much damage. And then you ask, well, can you aim them? Well, we don't worry about that, you know? We don't worry about aiming the cannons. We just, we just focus on power. We want to have some power. And the battleship next to them is saying, well, we don't want to be like those guys. We have perfect aim in our cannons. We have the perfect aim, and we can aim them in a second. We can aim them directly where the target is. And you ask, okay, how well do they shoot? Well, they don't really shoot because we don't put gunpowder in them, but the aim is perfect. Which of these battleships is going to be effective in battle? Neither of them, right? They're both going to be useless or destructive. And that's the same way about Christianity. There's kind of like two fringes on Christianity. There's ones that focus, again, on education and on theology, and that's all we're going to do. And there's the ones that focus on spirit, and 
the gifts of the Spirit and say, that's all we're going to do. And the truth of that is, we need both of them. Jesus said we worship in spirit and in truth. You can't have uh, effective ministry, you can't have effective Christian life without, with only a focus on the spirit but not on the truth. And you can't have it only focused on the truth but not on the spirit. And we kind of see that in the Bible too. One example of people who are with a lot of power but in the wrong direction, with a lot of spirit but not much truth, is when the disciples wanted to call down fire on a town that rejected Jesus, right? They could have done it. I believe that they had the power at that time. Jesus gave them a lot of power. They could have done it. But the direction was wrong. They were pointed in the wrong direction. They were about to do damage to a bunch of people that Jesus did not want to be judged at the moment. And Jesus said, you don't know what spirit you're of. An example of the other one, the people who had the right direction, they were doing the right thing, but they had no power to back it up, is the seven sons of Sceva, the high priest. In Acts chapter 19, it talks about these men who tried to cast out a demon in the name of Jesus who Paul was preaching. Man, they even used the right words. They used the name of Jesus, which is the same name Paul was using. But the difference was, Paul had the power, these men didn't. And what happened? The demon beat them, basically, and he, it, was, it was over for them. They ran out of there and said, naked and beaten, because they had no power, even though they were doing the right thing. And we see a man like Apostle Paul, he had both. He knew very well the doctrine, he knew very well his own calling, and he also had the power to back it up. He told the Corinthians, I'm not going to test your words, I'm going to test your power. He, when he made even the smallest mistake, when he was going to go into a town, the Holy Spirit didn't let him because he had both the leading of God and the power of God. So how do we do this in our lives? And, it, you know, a lot of Christians look for, like, a simple five-step formula or something that will give them an easy, easy, like, glide-through method to get perfect Christianity in their lives. Well, it doesn't really work that way. And I've mentioned this in a previous sermon. There's the basic things that we all know. We just got to be consistent in them. Prayer and fasting... That gives you power because you come, become connected to God. Reading the Bible, I mean, reading the, theology books once in a while, as long as they're, you know, good, because that's not a sin. Um, reading the Bible, praying, staying in a Christian community so you don't stay around friends who drag you into sin or drag you into bad things, and staying out of sin. There's really four things that you need, and we all know these things. We've all been taught them from a young age, but just because something is simple doesn't mean it's easy, right? Like... The concept of losing 50 pounds is simple. You eat less calories than you burn. But if anybody's ever tried it, and I have, it's not, a, it's not an easy thing, even though it's very, very simple. It's the same way with this. It's pretty simple to consistently read the Bible and pray, but it's not easy to do it, if that makes sense. The concept is simple, but the process is not easy. So I just want to encourage everybody, don't look for a, some kind of complicated system or some kind of new teaching where it shows you some easy shortcut to a strong spiritual life, because if you want to have both spirit and truth in your life, in your worship, and in your service, and in our church, like, I really want that. If we want to have that in our church, we've got to do these things consistently. We've, we've got to just stick to the basics and do them well. And if there's anything else, then God will teach us. So I just want to encourage everybody, you know, let's stick to the basics, let's do it, and we will have this. We will have the correct doctrine in church. We won't have all these weird prophecies and people, you know, leaving or getting married because of prophecies and then ruining their, ruining their lives like I'm sure you've heard, and we won't have people who are just dry and theological and don't have any power in them. So I'd like to encourage that, and that's pretty much the end of my sermon. If we could have the Sunday school students come out here, we're going to pray for you and bless you uh, for your lesson so that you can have uh, a lesson in spirit and truth as well.